Hi, welcome to English Buddhist Terminology. Last week, we have taken you into the door of Buddhism, which was to take refuge in the Triple Gem. So this week, we will walk you through with the second step of becoming a Buddhist, which is observing the Buddhist Five Precepts. The Buddhist Five Precepts is the basis of all Buddhist morality. So let me begin by talking about the contents of the Buddhist Five Precepts. Five Precepts in Chinese means Wu Jie, and Jie here means to refrain from doing certain things or to stop doing certain things. And what is consisted in these Five Precepts? The first one is no killing. In Chinese, it's Bu Sha Sheng. The second is no stealing. So the Chinese becomes Bu Tou Dao. And the third is no sexual misconduct. In Chinese, it becomes Bu Xie Ying. And the fourth is no lying. In Chinese, it means Bu Wang Yu. And the last of the five precepts is no intoxicants, and Chinese is Bu Ying Jiu. So within these five precepts, there are two basic principles of behavior that lies within them. The first one is to keep from harming other beings. And the second is to take a step further. So not only do we not do bad things, we take this positive step and try to do good to help other people. In Buddhism, no one is forced to take the five precepts because the five precepts, once you take them, it does not mean to put a restraint on yourself. Rather, the five precepts is the basis of all Buddhist morality and also the basis of, of all goodness. Therefore, what the five precepts try to show us is that our self or the self is preeminent. So there's also the need to respect other people's rights, their feelings and their needs. In principle, we've, thought, we've said that the five precepts means to refrain from trespassing and harming other people. And in other words, true freedom only comes when we do not obstruct the freedom or the right of other people. I'm going to explain each of the five precepts in detail. The first one is no killing. No killing means, or let me go back to the word killing. Killing means to violate other people's right to life. Therefore, no killing means that we respect other people's right to live. Killing is an extreme way, ex uh, an extreme harm that we can cause in other people and also around this world. So therefore, by not killing or observing the precept of not killing, we are showing respect to all forms of life in this world. Therefore, even the smallest forms of life should not be killed. For example, the insects, cockroaches or ants. Just because they're small, it doesn't mean that we should kill them just so easily and without thinking that they're important. Here, in Buddhism, humans are placed as the center of this religion. So the major focus of the precept of no killing is focusing on the act of refraining, refraining from killing other human beings. Therefore, if the act of killing other human beings is committed, that means one has violated the Parajika precept of no killing. Here, Parajika means the the most severe, uh, a severe violation that a Buddhist can ever do. So it is an act that cannot be repented. I've talked about killing insects before, and although it's not the same as killing a human being, it still means that you have committed the act of killing. The difference between killing an insect or a smaller form of life or as well, and the killing and a human being is the fact that killing an insect is only considered a bad seed or an impure conduct. Therefore, this bad seed can be eradicated by sincere acts of um, repentance. However, 
Although this can be eradicated, and although you have done a small act of killing, you must be aware that you're not doing this act of killing with a sense of happiness, nor should you do the killing by asking other people to do it, or feeling happiness when you see other people do the killing. Because either way, when you have done any of these, you have still committed the act of killing. So killing, are there other forms of killing? Say, for example, killing that is done out of compassion. If you have to kill one person, one bad villain, to save 100 innocent lives, although you have still committed the act of, uh, the act of killing, your intention is different. Therefore, the severity of this violation of no killing will be different. Killing is placed as the top of the five precepts because it is the least subtle and it is also the foundation of all the other five. So we try to place it as the first to help you see that once you see that killing is wrong, perhaps you also find the ability to see that all the rest four, the remaining four, is also wrong because they also cause harm. Killing teaches us compassion and consideration for others so that we will place a heavier consideration for the other people's needs or their rights. So this is about the aspect of seeing that all beings are one. So when I put myself in your position or when I see you as myself, we're being one. If I see that, then I wouldn't want to do the things that, that well, say, if they are the things that I don't, do not want to be done to myself, then I wouldn't do the same to you. This can be well explained by Confucius saying that, do not do to others what do you do not wish to be done to yourself. In Chinese, it becomes, ji suo bu yu, wu shi yu ren. So it is important for us to respect others the way we respect ourselves, as it all comes down to the idea that we are all part of the one thing in this world. Now, we've talked about not killing human beings and not killing animals. So what place does a plant stand in this precept? A plant is different from an animal in the fact that it, has no, it is not sentient, that it does not have an awareness. Therefore, it is different from killing an animal because an, an animal too is a sentient being. Therefore, a sentient being needs extra care from, other, from us because we know that there are also sentient beings waiting to be completely awakened. That's why we pay extra attention to animals. Here, you may then ask me why then do Buddhists observe vegetarianism? Well, Buddhists Buddhists observe vegetarianism, so it is a form of practice, practicing their compassion and respect for all other beings. And also, Buddhists observe vegetarianism to use it as a way for them to stay away from the cycle of raising or killing other animals. The following two verses will explain quite well of what this means. Here it says, if you want to know the misfortune of what, uh, excuse me, I'll start again. If you want to know what the misfortune of war is like, just stand outside the slaughterhouse at night and listen. In Chinese, it becomes, 预知世上刀兵劫,但听徒们夜半生. The other verse goes as followed. My flesh, sentient beings flesh, names different, nature the same of the same nature, taking on different forms. Let the animals suffer pain and agony while I enjoy their sweet and tender flesh. Without waiting for Yama to judge, we ourselves can imagine what the consequences shall be. So the Chinese for this version becomes 我肉众生肉,明书体不书,圆同一种性,只是别行区,苦恼从他受, so this explains the importance for us to respect the lives of other animals as much as we respect our own lives as well as other sentient, other human beings' lives. There's a saying in the great Nirvana Sutra, people who eat meat, 
disturb the growth of great compassion, whether they are walking, standing, sitting or lying down. Other sentient beings can smell the meat they have eaten, and thus they are made afraid. There are no excuses for killing, so one cannot pretend that he doesn't know what he has done, just because even if he does so. So excuses are useless. Just because you see that you see a human being as a tree stump in the dark doesn't mean that it is right for you to kill that human being because you're simply using it as an excuse and you still have committed the act of killing. We're going to go into a short break and after we come back, I will finish on the last bit of no killing and continue with the other four precepts. So stay with us. Before the break, I was talking about how there should be no excuses to killing because it doesn't matter or under whatever circumstances, once you have done the act of killing, you will have created the karma of killing. So now, let me round off on the precept of no killing by talking about a few effects that killing can place in our mind. So the first effect to ha having committed the, uh, committed the act of killing is that our mind will be full of poison. So therefore, once our mind is full of poison, it will be hard for us to feel at ease. The second effect is that once we have committed the act of killing, there will be more negativity and anger in our mind, so, and also in the world. Therefore, in this world, and, and also in our mind, there will be less joyful or positive emotions or attitudes once we have done the act of killing. And the third effect is that once we have done the act of killing, we will feel very anxious and of course it will be very hard for us to sleep at night and there is nothing to feel joyful about. And the last effect here is that one will feel very terrified upon time of death because you have this behind your guilty conscience, so when you, when you pass away, or when you're about to pass away, you will not feel a sense of security. And also, having committed that of killing will result in rebirth in conditions that are less likely to lead you to enlightenment, let me put it that way. So that was about the precept of no killing. The second is no stealing. No stealing means not to violate other people's property or trust, uh, as well as their trust in the integrity of the world. So here, the definition of stealing can come down to taking things that don't belong to you, or taking things without the owner's permission, or taking things without returning them. Where, for example, if I borrow a cup from you, and then I never return it, I keep it to myself. This is also an act of stealing. And the last definition I have here for you is um, when you steal, it means that you return borrowed stuff in a damaged form. So going back to that cup I have borrowed, okay, say if I do return the cup in the end, but it has been damaged or broken, this is because I haven't been able to take good care of this thing I have borrowed. Therefore, I have also committed the act, of, act, uh, the act of stealing in this case. On the other hand, we, if we go into the park and enjoy what belongs to the public, and that means we are not really committing the act of stealing. For example, if you go out and enjoy sunlight, if you go out to enjoy fresh air, and if you go out and enjoy the beautiful scenery in Mother Nature, you're not stealing anything because this belongs to everybody. So you, in a way, you're not taking any of these things for your own benefit. And once you can achieve this, 
That means you are refraining from the act of stealing. The parajika form or the parajika violation of no stealing means stealing things over paltry value. For example, this is only an example to give you a basic idea of what I mean by things over paltry value. For example, say if someone steals the, uh, an amount of money of over 400 US dollars, then this way you have committed the Parajika va uh, precept of no stealing. But does this mean that it is okay for you to take things or steal things under the paltry value or the value you have just defined? No, because when you steal smaller things, for example, if you take um, office stationery or when you use things without asking, although these are still forms of stealing, but they are only considered impure actions or conducts. Therefore, these are the things that can be repented. Stealing is the hardest precept. It's or, well, it's not the hardest, but it's one of the hardest precepts to keep because most of us are often tempted by our desire to take things or get hold of uh, things that do not belong to us. For example, to keep a friend's book or take a towel when you stay at a hotel before you go away or using company telephone for your own purpose. These are all considered impure actions. We know that a sage never clings to anything, therefore nothing will cling to him because he has no desires. However, as for us as ordinary people, we cling to a lot of things. So in many cases, we'll be bound by our delusions, bound to our delusions by both our karma and greed. A few effects to stealing include rebirth in one of the three lower realms. The three lower realms here in Chinese means San Er Dao, or the realms of animals, hell, or hungry ghosts. Or the other effect is that after you have committed the act of stealing, even though you can be reborn as a human being, you will most likely become reborn as a poor person for what you have done. So that was the basic content of the precept of no stealing. Now let us go on to the third, the third item of the five precepts, which is no sexual misconduct. No sexual misconduct means not violating other people's right to a good name or a happy family. So here, my definition of no sexual misconduct means any sexual behavior that violates the laws or the morals of society. For example, having an affair, incest, bigamy, prostitution, rape, trading sex for money or favors, or engaging in sexual activity, activities that arouse unreasonable emotions. That is, emotions that will come, that are caused by our greed, anger, and ignorance. Having an affair here, in particular, out of all the examples I have given you, it actually puts a threat on the happiness of a family. So, if you would like to reverse the position, if you are the one who want to enjoy a happy family, you must refrain from, um, from having an affair because this is both a way to protect your own family and the other person's good name as well as family. The fourth item of the five precept comes to no lying. No lying means vi not violating the trust of people and cause their doubt in their own intuitions. So, because this is a, both a waste of time and energy, and it will cause a lot of harm in both yourself and other people. The definition of no lying means deceit, duplicity, forgery, distortion, presentation of misinformation, and slander. Here, basically, there are two kinds of lies. The first one is lie of omission. Uh, of commission. The first one is the lie of commission, which means an outright lie. Say, for example, you just lie. You just lie about things and cause people to be confused of what the thing truly is. And the second one is the lie of omission. 
This means withholding information to deceive someone. So therefore, even though you're not saying that you don't know something that you do know about, you're still holding back this information. And this will stop someone from finding out what the truth is. Lying can be further divided into three categories. The first one is great lies. A great lie means when you lie about you having attained enlightenment or when you lie about the fact that you possess supernatural power but in truth that you don't. Therefore, once you do this, you have committed the parajika violation of the precept of no lying. The second of the, th the three categories is the less serious lies. Although this is not as severe as the first one, you're still lying about things that you have seen, but you say you haven't seen it. Or you lie about, you don't know about certain things which you, you actually know about. Or when things exist, you say that they do not exist. Or when things do not exist, you tell people that certain things are there. Or when certain things are true, you tell them that it's false, or vice versa. These are examples of the less serious lies. The third is the lies of convenience. These are done out of intention that to stop to prevent yourself from causing any inconvenience or trouble for other people. Say for example, when you lie to a terminally ill person to prevent him from breaking down um, by finding out that there is no more hope in his life. Or when you lie about you having already had a meal so that other people don't have to prepare a meal for you. So that was a lie of convenience. So this is a lie that does more good than harm. So this is not really a violation against the precept of not lying. Now it's time for us to go into another break. So after the break, I will continue with the precept of no lying. <laughs> 